Our scripture this morning is from the Hebrew Bible, chapter 119, or excuse me, Psalm 119, which is one of those long ones. Um, so I'm going to read a portion of it, and then I'm going to follow with a reading from Job, which you already heard once today, because Judy incorporated it into the assurance, but I thought it was worth hearing more than once. So from Psalm 119. Oh, and I'm going to ask you to do something with this. Take a moment right now and think about um, like your favorite tree, if you brought a tree in and put the picture downstairs, if there's a particular species that you love, if you're thinking about maybe all of the palm trees that you've seen in the devastation from Hurricane Irma. If you have any kind of tree, bring a tree to mind for a moment, and then I'm going to read these words, and I'm going to ask you to hear them from the perspective of a tree. So this is the tree's lament. I call with my whole heart, answer me, O God, that I might keep your statutes. To you I call, O oh, save me, and I shall keep your testimonies. Early in the morning I cry to you, for in your word is my trust. My eyes are open before the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Hear my voice, O Lord, according to your faithful love, according to your judgment, give me life. They draw near that in malice persecute me who are far from your law. You, O Lord, are near at hand, and all of your commandments are true. Long I have known your testimonies that you have founded from forever. Consider my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. According to your promise, give me life. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statues. Great is your compassion, O Lord. Give me life according to your judgments. Many there are that persecute and oppress me, yet I do not swerve from your testimonies. It grieves me when I see the treacherous, for they do not keep your word. Consider, O Lord, how I love your commandments. Give me life according to your loving kindness. The sum of your word is truth, and all of your righteous judgments endure forevermore. The text from Job is what gives us our theme for creation season, but it is also, if we continue in this thought experiment, the response to the tree. For there is hope for a tree, if it is cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its roots shall not cease, or shoots will not cease. Though its root grows deep in the earth, its stump dies in the ground, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put forth branches like a young plant. May these words be to us our light and life. When I was a child, I had a reading tree. It was a large oak located in my backyard at the bottom of the hill, and one of the lower branches had a dip in it that formed a natural chair. And the limb was just wide enough for me to settle in, lean back, and read. On summer days, I would read through the twilight hours, only climbing down when it became too hard to make out the letters in the deepening dusk. It was here that I read countless Nancy Drew books, where I met Heathcliff on the moors, and absorbed any number of life lessons from the transcendentalism of Louisa May Alcott. Today, Given the astonishing things that we're learning about trees, I realize I may have absorbed as much from the oak as I did from Alcott's heroines. Because it's amazing, isn't it? All of the stuff that's coming out now about trees, the books, the articles, I mean, 
I could talk here until next Sunday nonstop and not exhaust all of the stuff that's just been coming out. But then there's trees in mythology and trees in metaphor and the science of trees and trees as therapy and trees in literature, trees as the fuel of industry and innovative products, trees as history recorded as rings in their trunks and recorded as words on the paper that they make possible. Trees as teachers, trees as warnings, trees as prophets. With their roots in the ground and their trunks above ground and their branches stretching upward into the skies, trees have long served as the imaginative link between worlds, as the structure of the universe. In Norse myth, Yggdrasil, the world tree, runs like a pole through this world and into the other realms as well, above and below. It connects and nourishes all living things in all phases of existence, before, during, and after life. The Upanishads of India tell of Asvata, the inverted cosmic tree, with its roots in the sky and its leaves underground. Slavic myths include a tree of life that bore all of the world's seeds to all of the world's plants. Talking trees delivered oracles in ancient Greece and spoke prophecy to the Druids. Gautama Buddha's enlightenment happened under a Bodhi tree. The prophet Muhammad leaned against a date tree when he taught. And of course, in Genesis, we have Adam and Eve and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When Adam and Eve are cast out and told that they are now responsible for growing their own food, we implicitly grasp that the cultivation of good or evil is now up to us. And whatever we sow, that is what we will reap. In the world's great mythologies, trees are both sapient and sentient. That is, they are associated with wisdom, with hidden secrets, but they are also capable of subjective experience. They have feelings. For this reason, trees are widely held to embody the qualities of interconnectedness and compassion. Our stories and our myths are full of the sapient and sentient aspect of trees. But lately, I have been astonished by the degree to which science is also exploring these twin aspects. Here are just a few things. Trees communicate with each other and with their environment. Above ground trees warn each other about insect attacks Undamaged trees nearby respond by pumping out bug-repelling chemicals to protect themselves. Underground, there is a web of fungi connecting the trees and plants of an ecosystem, enabling the sharing of resources. Microscopic experimentation has shown that fungi actually move carbon, water, and nutrients between trees depending upon their needs. Not only that, as climate change stalks northern forests, scientists have determined that the dying Douglas firs are transferring food to the incoming ponderosa pines and also sending them stress signals to stimulate them into synthesizing defensive enzymes that will help them prepare for dangers still to come. This is not junk science or from the lunatic fringe. These are empirical data validated by replicable experiments. Trees talk to each other. They feel pain, they nurture others, they care for their relatives, they organize themselves into communities, and they have the ability to learn and remember. 
Given all of that, it's not surprising that some scientists are turning to one particular example of interspecies cooperation, that between trees and human beings. By now, many of you may have read about the Japanese practice of forest bathing. Forest bathing. And the state, state designated therapy forests that are there and in Korea. Decreased cortisol levels, blood pressure, and heart rate have all been measured and recorded in people who spend time in these forests. The parasympathetic system gets a boost, as well as the immune system. The task-focused prefrontal cortex takes a break, and the so-called default network associated with creativity, imagination, insight, and empathy kicks in. A lot of this happens via our sense of smell. The human nose can detect one trillion odors, including the essential oils emitted by trees, like the ones from conifers that lower blood pressure and other stress indicators. Nothing hits the brain's emotional neurons more powerfully than odor. Odor enters the primal brain, bypassing the blood-brain barrier, and some of you scientists out here could probably explain what that means to me. And it engages the area where our deepest memories are stored. So as you can tell, I'm kind of enamored of all of this. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, but after my swing through world literature and science, you may be wondering how I'm going to bring this around to faith and the liturgical season of creation. Can we really make an argument from trees for faith? Not as druids, I mean, but for Christian faith. Sidestepping for the moment the rather significant tree that stood on Calvary, I want to use trees to make two specific claims, one about the nature of God and the other about God's providence. Long ago, John Calvin claimed that God is revealed in two books, the Bible and the book of creation. I think that the revelation from trees is nothing short of wonderful. The conservationist John Muir once wrote, when we try to pick anything out by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. That's worth repeating. When we try to pick anything out by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And that is certainly true of trees. The tree, which appears to stand separate and alone, is intimately connected to other trees, to plants, to creatures, creatures that include us. Trees are sapient and sentient. They are the lungs of the, of the planet, which is something that Adam's going to talk about in a couple weeks. So the claim here is that the nature of God is relational, deeply, profoundly relational. But we live in a time when trees are, in the words of the psalmist that I had us imagine coming from a tree, trees are persecuted, afflicted and oppressed. When I read those words, I invited you to hear the words as the trees lament. We are losing too many trees. They are assailed on all sides, from the increasing chaos caused by global warming and from the chainsaws of industry. I don't need to belabor this loss, you know it as well as I. But even if climate change were not a clear and present danger, which it is, we are in the midst of another less noticeable loss. In the last few years, for the first time ever, 
the human population reached the, a milestone, we are now overwhelmingly urban. More people live in cities now than ever have. Our sense of smell is diminishing rapidly. Too many children are growing up without reading trees or trees of any kind at all. And if forest bathing reduces the stress-related factors that cause so many illnesses in humankind and boosts the ability of our immune systems to fight disease, then when the trees and the forest vanish, their mitigating benefits do too. But I also read from Job, and that's where we come to my second theological claim about God's providence. There is hope for the trees, whether we use the language of science or talk about and talk about that underground web of fungi, or if we use the poetic language from Job about the scent of water and the regeneration from an old stump. God provides a way forward. God takes what is and transforms it into what it can become. Now there are also two movements within these readings. The human response in the face of loss is grief. The divine response is hope and the promise of new life. In the coming days, we will likely have many things to grieve. And we must grieve. It is the appropriate and necessary response to loss. And it is also a response that clears the way for an authentic hope. Hope, according to theologians of the past, is not something endemic to human beings. Hope is what comes to us when our backs are to the wall, when human history has brought us to an impasse. Hope is something that transcends the impasse. It comes to us as the way out of no way, as the scent of water, as the transformation of the cross of death into the cross of life. Hope is an ever-present gift from God, but something that in terrible times we often forget, which is why God has filled creation with reminders, and why the faithful have filled the Bible with stories that nudge us back into remembering. God is present in the stump as the scent of water, God is present to us in the ecology of trees. God is present to us in Calgary's tree. God is present to us in the tree of knowledge. We have eaten that fruit. We know the difference between good and evil. Every day we're given a choice about what we will cultivate in our own gardens. And we are given a powerful example to follow. The tree of Genesis is repeated again in the tree of Calgary, and the issue of good and evil is raised once again. Having tasted that fruit, what can we say about the crucifixion of an innocent teacher, a man of God, a prophet? Good? Evil? And what can we say about the system that hung him there? Good or evil? But when the, then the story goes and asks us the most crucial question, are we stuck with that system, with the powers that be, with the way that empire is and its willingness to live with climate chaos as the new status quo? Is that the only way? Or is there an alternative? Is a better way possible? The trees say yes. The Gospels say yes. The transformation of the cross is God's yes. As people of faith, we 
can say yes and amen.